Um, so for you guys who are in the front row here, I have something. I'm just going to pick somebody out. This is a goodie bag. It's not a laundry bag, although it looks like it. This, uh, this goodie bag has five items that are going to be the clues to the movies we're going to talk about today. So this one is a Thomas the Choo Choo train. We have a box of Reese's Pieces, if that gives anybody any indication. A bag of truffles, truffle shuffle, if you guys remember that one. A banana that might have been used in a car somewhere. And then shower curtain rings. So that gives you any clues. So you guys can decide who gets what, but that's the, uh, the goodie bag, and you can have this as a souvenir too. Yeah, it's, it's a cool laundry bag. Um, so one of the first questions I get is, how does one become an 80s pop culture expert? And it's a great question to ask. So, like I said, I left the fashion and the haircuts back in the 80s. I took the music with me, I took the movies with me. But you become an 80s pop culture expert because you have haircuts like that, wearing Motley Crue t-shirts. You wear members only jackets with your tube socks pulled all the way up to your knees and really, really short shorts. You have bowl cuts. This is really an embarrassing trip down memory lane. You cut lines in your hair. And uh, I actually did this before Vanilla Ice, so I think he owes me a few bucks for that look, because that's circa 1987, I think. And then, of course, you carry it into the year when you're 40 years old, you dress like a Lambda 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 Revenge of the Nerd for Halloween. So, uh, yeah, so this is, this is how you become an 80s pop culture expert. Seriously, my friends got sick of hearing about the 80s movies and 80s television every time we talked, and they said, why don't you do something with this? So I was actually at home, um, kind of having a self-pity party of one. I was in a job that really wasn't working out for me, and I watched, started watching The Breakfast Club, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And there's a moment where John Bender, who's the, the criminal, he decides he doesn't want Principal Vernon to be able to see into the detention hall. And he takes the screws out of the door. And Principal Vernon comes in and says, hey, who took the screws out of the door? Which Bender says, well, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. And I started thinking, you know, the world is an imperfect place. And I have to stop feeling sorry for myself in this job that I was in and start to think about what else I can do. And in the process, I thought about it as the business world is also an imperfect place. And so from there, I went to LinkedIn and I wrote an article on what The Breakfast Club teaches us about today's workplace. And I got a pretty good response. I was surprised. And so I did another one on Ferris Bueller and work-life balance. And from there, I decided instead of giving it away for free, I'd write a book. And uh, I wrote a book with 10 movies in it called What 80s Pop Culture Teaches Us About Today's Workplace. And I parlayed that into speaking gigs, and here I am. So um, I think it's something I've been passionate about since... I guess 1980, when I was 10 years old. And, uh, and I finally parlayed it into something um, that I can do for a living, and I absolutely love it. So I'm gonna share a lot with you guys today. You're gonna hear me say a lot of times today, this is my favorite, this is my favorite, this is my favorite, because I can't pick. Uh, whether it's a character, or a movie, or a scene, or a quote, uh, I, just, I just love everything about the 80s, so. Um, this is a quote from my book that really, I think, encapsulates uh, our career journeys, and it does it in a way that uh, it ties in the 80s. So look, we aren't perfect, and someone whose career journey is exactly as they dreamed it would be is in the words of the early 80s Madonna, a lucky star. Your journey will probably look more like the chaotic but entertaining travels and Bill and Ted's excellent adventure than the substantially less bumpy traipses of the Golden Girls. And I hope that's been the case for you guys so far, because it's much more entertaining to have a career that has bumps along the way instead of just this kind of smooth sailing thing. It makes you a better person, it makes you a better human, and a lot of the lessons that we're going to talk about today are based on the fact that things get sometimes a little bumpy in our careers. So the first movie that we're going to talk about today is The Goonies, and that's the bag of truffles there. For those of you who have seen The Goonies in uh, The Truffle Shuffle, it's a famous scene. So this, this movie actually came out in June of 1985, which is 33 years ago. For me, that's pretty terrifying. I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's pretty terrifying. Um, what was cool about the 80s as well is the music. And so if you look at the, if you look at the music charts today, everything, I, I hate to sound old, but I'm going to sound it, everything sounds the same. And the reality is it's really all the same genre. And if you looked at the 80s movie chart, or music charts in the 80s, there was a real eclectic feel to them. And for instance, in June of 1985 when The Goonies came out, Tears for Fears was on the charts, uh, Katrina and the Waves, which Walking on Sunshine, and if, if, 
If you guys know that song, it might be stuck in your head later today. You can thank me for that. Uh, Duran Duran, which was uh, just a staple in the 80s, and also Wham. So it was a pretty eclectic group of bands that were in the, uh, on the, the top 40. Beverly Hills Cop and Fletch were at the box office, as well as the Goonies, obviously. And on the beach, people were relaxing, reading books like The Vampire Lestat, uh, Less Than Zero. If you guys have ever seen that movie, it's pretty dark and disturbing, but it's, it's worth a watch. And um, the, all things Danielle Steele. I never read a Danielle Steele novel, but I gave one to my mom for her birthday and Christmas for about seven years straight. That was my gift to her, like my dad got Old Spice, my mom got a Danielle Steele book. That was kind of the way it worked. Uh, the Goonies, if you're unfamiliar with the movie, just a quick kind of plot. There were six kids, Brand, Mouth, Chunk, Andy, Steph, and Data. And these guys made up the Goonies. They were a ragtag bunch of kids. Their community, their house their, where they lived, was being developed. And so in, within a month's time, all of their houses were going to be gone. And they were desperately trying to find a way to keep their neighborhood alive. And so they're in one of the attics of, uh, they're in Chuck, uh, sorry, Mikey's attic. And they come across, across a treasure map for a pirate named One-Eyed Willie, this legend in the town that said that One-Eyed Willie was this pirate who left this great treasure. And so they decide to go on this adventure. And the adventure is to find this treasure so that they can cash it in and save their community. And there's some great 80s movies like this. Time Bandits is one, The Explorers is another. If you haven't heard of those, I recommend you go back and watch those. If you like the Goonies, they're in the same genre. They're super cool movies. So they, the, these guys, the, the ragtag bunch of Goonies taught us a couple of lessons. And one of them came from a scene when Mikey says, Goonies never say die. And it was a moment when they felt that the quest was too much for them to handle. They had too many challenges. They were running into all sorts of things. They had uh, the kids, the other kids in the neighborhood who were bullying them. They had skeletons and rats down in the tunnels. They had floors falling out from below them. They had underground tunnels. They had a treasure map that was really difficult to read. And all the other kids just wanted to give up and they wanted to go home. And Mikey did a great speech, not, not probably as great as any given Sunday speech, but a really good speech. Uh, and he talked about how Goonies never say die. And I think to, to relate that to, to business today, most of us have felt overwhelmed. We felt challenged. We felt like outmaneuvered maybe or at a point where in our careers where things just aren't going the way we want them to go. Maybe it's a project with a team and the project isn't going the way that we'd like it to go, right? And so we just say we want to give up. We don't, we, we, there's too many challenges. We can't do it anymore. Let's go somewhere else. Let's try something different. But that's actually the perfect time to start brainstorming. It's all ultimately when the best solutions come to the surface, when you feel like you just can't get there. And so the, the lesson in that is to never give up. And Mikey got these kids to say, look, take out the treasure map, lay it out in front of everyone, look at it a different way. And this, this can relate to your business as well. Take that project out. Lay it out, look at it a completely different way. Start fresh, because there's going to be a solution, there's going to be a path, it's just up to you to find it. Never give up and never let the team give up, most importantly. Especially all of you in here are probably managers and leaders. You're the ones that everybody looks to on your team. And when you kind of throw your hands up and say, it's just not possible, or I don't know where to go from here, then the rest of the team is gonna take that attitude with them as well. So make sure that when, that, when you get to that point, just get your inner Mikey from Goonies and never give up. Tell them, never say die. And if you're really, you know, if you're like me, you love the 80s, walk into your office tomorrow or the next time you're in there, and just in the, in the morning, just walk in the middle of the office and say, hey, you guys, just like Sloth from Chunk, or Sloth from uh, Goonies. It's, it's exhilarating, trust me, everybody will look at you weird, but it's a lot of fun. Now these guys actually taught us another lesson I think is, actually, is more important than the never give up lesson for today's workplace and, and for life in general. And these two guys, if you know the Goonies, this is Chunk and Sloth. And Chunk actually is a very famous entertainment attorney in LA. He's done very well with his career outside of acting. Sloth was played by Ted Matuzak, who played for the Oakland Raiders with Lyle Alzado, and unfortunately passed away years ago. Um, but he was an awesome character in this. And these two guys taught us something really awesome. So there's a point in the movie where Chunk is captured by a family of bandits and they throw him in the basement with a chained up sloth. Sloth is chained up in front of a TV. And the reason he's chained up is his family really doesn't love him. Not because he's not a good person, but because of the way he looks. He's got a cone-shaped head. He's got ears that wiggle. He's got eyes that are, you know, a one eye drooping lower than the other. And he, as uh, Chunk so eloquently puts, smells like phys ed. And um, we meet Sloth because he's just unloved. And all he wants to do is have somebody 
to hang out with. He wants a group. He wants to be part of something. And Chunk can look through all of this, all of his physical appearances, the, the fact that he smells like phys ed, and embraces him and says, look, I just want to be your friend. I want you to be in our group. And he takes him in. And because of this, Sloth shows his loyalty at the end of the movie, which is his biggest asset, by saving their lives. In fact, fighting his own family to save the lives of the Goonies. So ultimately, that teaches us about inclusion, right? Our teams and our companies are stronger when we embrace everyone regardless of their cone-shaped heads, odd-looking ears that wiggle, or the fact that they may just smell like phys ed. Clicks are for high school, and I think we all, we've all been in clicks at some point in our lives, but they really are for high school. They're not for the workplace. And if you embrace everyone, we'll all succeed. So you might be surprised, too, that person that maybe doesn't talk as much in meetings or maybe keeps to themselves, goes out to lunch by themselves, bring them into the group. Include them. You might be surprised what they can actually offer the group, particularly when you're at that point where you're thinking that the challenges are too much and you just want to give up. So this is, I think, a really important lesson for today, also for the workplace, inclusion. Bring sloth into the group. Bring the kid in, bring the guy in, bring the girl in who has the cone-shaped head, and include them. You might just be surprised. So during uh, my, my talk today, there's going to be a few things I'm calling mixtape quizzes. And if you guess, I'm going to give you a couple of business lessons from a movie in the 80s. And if you can guess that lesson, just yell it out or raise your hand, and I have a prize for you. And if you get it wrong, I have a... Better prize, I think. Um, okay, so the first lesson is your craziest idea may be the one that works. Be prepared or face the consequences. That's lesson number one. It's a little generic, but lesson number two might help you. And make friends with the IT team. They can make you look like a hero or a pile of doo-doo, for lack of a better word. Does anybody have a clue? I need to start giving you guys a little couple clues here. Revenge of the nerds. Close. Same time frame. Yeah, pretty close. So now you're actually going to get a not so good prize. Um, okay. So, as far as clues, the first one Robert Downey Jr. had a co starring role. Weird Science. Got it. Good job. Yeah, it is Weird Science. That's those guys right there. I can honestly say I never wore a bra on my head, but. So, I have two prizes here. Let's get down here and get these out. Both of them are fun, just one is really horrifying to look at, which is me dressed as a Revenge of the Nerds, which is appropriate since you uh, in, a, in a book. Thank you. Yeah. Which is appropriate since that's what you guessed, right? <laughs> yeah, please don't. Unless, unless you want your friends to be scared every time they come in your, your house. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next movie here. Um, Beverly Hills Cop and Axel Foley. And so this, this movie, um, again, one of my favorites. And Eddie Murphy in his prime, right? Uh, it came out in December of 1984. Uh, that was my freshman year of high school. I had braces. And for those of you that know the movie 16 Candles, I was just like Farmer Ted. I had the huge headgear. Uh, I was supposed to wear it at night, but even though no one was around, it embarrassed me anyway. So usually in the middle of the night, I would take it off because I just hated it. Now my teeth are crooked, so... I guess you pay the price, right? Um, like I said before, the top 40, the music charts, were full of super eclectic music. Everything from Hall & Oates, which is still very good today, I think. Uh, the Honey Drippers, which was a 50s throwback, if you guys remember uh, The Sea of Love was a song that they had. Uh, Irish rock band named U2, I don't think anybody heard of them again, they kind of just disappeared. And then uh, the modern, modern day barbershop quartet, New Edition. And they had a song called Cool It Now, which is another one you can thank me for later if it's stuck in your head, or Mr. Telephone Man. So, um, pretty cool time for music. And at the box office, Chuck Norris was killing it, literally and figuratively, with Missing in Action. He, I think he had a movie every six months at that time. Freddy Krueger was also killing it at Nightmare on Elm Street. And we had, most famously, Arnold Schwarzenegger introduce us to uh, three famous words in the American lexicon now, I'll be back, All right? But the one that went under the radar and surprised me actually when I was doing research for the book, there was, a, there was a show called The Duck Factory that came out and it was out for about, I guess, three months and then it just went off the air. And the guy who starred in that show that nobody really knew at the time was Jim Carrey. And so uh, I found that interesting that he was in this movie, or in this show in 1984 and then really, in living color, really propelled his career about three or four years later. But it shows that everybody has to start somewhere. 
So Axel Foley was, for those of you that don't know, quick little plot synopsis, he was a street smart detective from Detroit. His best friend had been murdered and he was on a mission to solve the crime. Trying to solve the crime took him out to Beverly Hills. His Sergeant Inspector Todd said, I don't want you out there meddling in things. If you're going out there, go for vacation. And if you've seen the movie, Inspector Todd was a really good character actor who stole a lot of scenes, even with Eddie Murphy. And he was a real police detective. They found him and used him for the movie, and he had a nice little career after that. Uh, but he told him, don't meddle. Just don't get involved. And he said, fine. But of course, that wasn't the case. He gets out there, he gets involved right away. He gets thrown through a plate glass window on the middle of the street, and then he gets arrested for disturbing the peace. So at that point, his gun, his badge, everything is taken from him, and they told him, tell him basically, if you keep meddling, we're gonna kick you out of town. And of course, he doesn't listen. So, Axel taught us a number of things about the workplace, but I chose two lessons here that I think are really important. When Axel convinced, uh, he convinced his newfound Beverly Hills team members, Taggart and Rosewood. And Taggart and Rosewood were two detectives that were assigned to him, said, look, don't let him go anywhere. Don't let him get out of town. Don't let him go anywhere. Um, I'm sorry, don't let, don't let him go anywhere, get him out of town. So Taggart and Rosewood stay around him, stay very close to him. Their goal is drive him out of town. Doesn't work that way. He convinces them to go into a bar, I would call it a bar, it was really an adult establishment during the day, to have some drinks because he believes that the organized crime boss that he's looking for owns this bar. And so they're in there and an armed robbery begins to unfold. And Axel sees it before the other detectives and breaks it up and tells them, hey, this is going on. The three of them foil this robbery, which should, in essence, give them an award when they get back to the office, but it doesn't because they were supposed to get him out of town. So they're confronted by their sergeant, who's uh, basically reprimanding them to the point where he's going to suspend or fire them. And this is when Axel steps up. And he spins a story to the superiors and says, essentially, those two guys were the ones who saw the armed robber. They're the ones who actually saved the day. And all they were doing was their job. He dragged them in there. He forced them to follow him because he ran away from them and went into the club and they followed him in. They were just doing their job and in the process, they were, as he said, super cops. And they saved the lives of everybody in this establishment by foiling the armed robbery. So what do we learn from that? What we learned was protect your team. And again, I go back to a lot of you guys are probably managers, leaders here. You have teams. Protect your team even if you have to stretch the truth a little. Because when your team knows that you might be telling a little bit of a white lie for them to protect them, or even to put them in a position where they're the ones who are the heroes, even if you were the one who solved the problem, it goes a long way, obviously, towards loyalty. And they won't forget it. And neither will you. And sometimes you'll be surprised by your boss and how they react to the fact, even if they know that you're kind of stretching the truth a little to try to protect your team, if you have a good boss, they'll react in a, in a good way as well. They may not at that moment, but later on they're gonna to come to you and they're gonna respect the fact that you stood up for your team, that you put yourself in a serious line of fire to defend your team. And that's what leaders do, that's what managers do. And that's what Axel did to protect these guys. And after the sergeant leaves, he kind of looks at the guys because they were honest and said, actually it was Axel who did all of this, it wasn't us. He's the real hero in this. And he says, you know, the super cop hero story was working and you guys just messed it up. So he, he has a little fun with them, he pokes a little fun with them at the end, but the reality is he does step up and take the bullets for him. And that's a really important lesson for us to learn. The second lesson that we learned from Axel, and this was when he was thrown in the back of the police car for disturbing the peace by getting thrown through a window somehow. I don't know how that's disturbing the peace, but that's what happened to him. And so he has no gun, he has no badge, nothing, no resources at hand, at least physical resources that we can see. And the Beverly Hills PD has everything. They have enough guns and ammo for a military. They have computers, which in 1984, for those of you that remember, were very, very rare. Um, if you had a brother word processor, you were super lucky. Um, no computer, they had a lot of computers. They had GPS. They had the cleanest and nicest police cars he's ever been in, nicer than his apartment. They had mahogany walls in their offices, a la uh, Anchorman. So they had all of the resources that they needed. And, Eddie, and, and Axel Foley had none. But he actually had a lot. He had this internal toolbox of resources. He had his instincts, he had his guts, he had his intuition, he had his intelligence, he had his street smarts. He had all of these things that we can't see physically that he could bring to the table. And those things were better than guns and ammo and nicest and cleanest police cars and GPS and computers because they, they were from a real life situation. They were from experience that he had. 
And so he was able to pull on this internal toolkit and solve the crime before the Beverly Hills Police Department did, even with all of their resources. And I think we've all been there, right? You've been in a job interview where you feel like you're the least experienced person maybe. You might have started a business and you feel like you're like a little rowboat with all these super tankers and super yachts out there and you just, you're thinking, how am I gonna compete with these guys? You have pitches for larger business and you think this is great that we're out here, but can we really get this? And the lesson in that is that your best resource is you. And this is what Axel taught us. They remember that big bad competitor was once just like you. I mean, they were outgunned, outmanned, outresourced, but they found a way and they used their inner, in their inner resources, their experience in the job, their experience in the career, their experience in the industry. So I say turn on your inner, inner Detroit, find your Axel Foley, and if you get really down to it and nothing else is working, I hear that a banana in the tailpipe is the perfect trick. So if, if that happens, you know, you're, you're done with the, the pitch, maybe you just walk outside, put a banana in the tailpipe of your competitor's car and see what happens. I, I've never done it, but I hear it works. So honestly, your best resource is you, and this is what Axel taught us. And no matter how many resources your competitors have, you always can find a way to beat them. And there's, if, if, there, if that wasn't the case, we would never have great stories. We'd never have big companies. Companies like Apple would not be Apple today if they didn't believe that they could outgun and outman the competitors who had years of experience on them, had products that might have been at the time better, um, but they found a way. And so we see this every day. Google's another example when you talk about big data. Uh, there's a ton of examples of companies out there that have done this. And you guys, and everybody can do it, whether it's just for yourself or for your team or for your company. So I have one more movie here and then we're gonna go into another uh, pop quiz. And this one, one of my favorites, um, Stand By Me. Uh, if you guys have ever seen this movie and you kind of know the background, I'm not sure how many of you um, really read Stephen, Stephen King like I do, uh, but Stephen King is known for his horror, right? He's known for Children of the Corn and The Shining, but some of his best writing has actually been uh, life stories, life, life movies about life. And Stand By Me was one, Shawshank Redemption was another, The Green Mile is another. Um, these are incredible life stories. And Stand By Me is just a, it's a great story about, uh, it came out in August of 1986. And at that time, I was actually a junior in high school. That picture I showed you of the lines of my hair, what you didn't see is I painted them green um, with a magic marker that I think sunk into my skin. It wasn't really supposed to happen that way, but it did. And it was there for, I think, two months, two and a half months. I had green in my hair. It's kind of weird, but... Um, I wouldn't do that today, obviously. Although I did it, did it a couple years ago. I dressed up for Halloween. I used a permanent marker by accident. I had to explain that when I went into the office. Um, at this time, there was TV actually launched its first network, new network in 20 years, which was Fox Network, and Married with Children, which was a you know, very obviously famous show, and The Simpsons all came out of the Fox Network. <coughs> Married with Children was, uh, was a big show. ALF, which they're actually redoing, and we can get into a whole thing about remakes of movies and 80s movies, which... I don't know. I could talk about that for days. Uh, Perfect Strangers, if you guys remember that, there's Balky, right? He was also in Beverly Hills Cop, Bronson Pinchot. The Fall Guy, and then my all-time favorite, and the story about The Fall Guy, I was 13 years old, and I was out, and uh, I got lucky enough to go to Hollywood in one of the sets, and I met Heather Thomas, who at the time, when I was 13 years old, she was the sidekick on The Fall Guy. It was a dream come true for me. Um, and so I, I love The Fall Guy. And then Different Strokes, which was is still one of my favorites. I just think it's a, it was a great show, and... And obviously, you know, what you talk about, Willis, is still something people say today for fun. So, uh, top 40, again, very eclectic. Stevie Winwood was at the, on the charts, as well as uh, Jermaine Stewart. I don't know if you guys remember him. He was a one-hit wonder. We don't have to take our clothes off. Um, another one that you might be singing later. The Glory of Love, uh, Karate Kid, was uh, also at the top 40. Banana Rama. And then uh, one of my favorites, uh, Walk This Way, Run DMC, and Aerosmith was also on the charts. So as you can see, like, it was a really eclectic, creative, cool time. All of these different types of genres occupying our space in the top 40. And as I mentioned, Stand By Me was adapted from a Stephen King movie, The Body. And The Body was um, a short story in a book, four Se The Four Seasons, that also had The Shawshank Redemption. And if you haven't seen that, you need to see it. It was about four high school boys here, Vern, Chris, Gordy, and Teddy. And if you recognize these kids here, Will Wheaton is on the right. He's, uh, if you ever watch Big Bang Theory, he's on the Big Bang Theory quite a bit. He was on a Star Trek show. River Phoenix is in the back. He passed away, I guess, man, it was like 1990 or 91, I think. Um, in the front is Jerry O'Connell, who's had a pretty decent kind of career. And 
And then you have Corey Feldman, who's uh, still with us and um, hope, hopefully getting better. Um, they go on a, an adventure to find a missing uh, kid. And this missing kid, is, has, people say he's dead. Another kid has said, I saw his body down by the railroad tracks. And they go on an adventure to go find, see if they can find this kid or find, find the body, right? And it's an introspective and nostalgic look at when we were all kids. And the, there's a great line at the end of the movie, Richard Dreyfuss, who's the narrator, who is playing uh, Gordy, who's on the, uh, uh, on the right, who grown up, who's a writer. And he says that uh, we never... I know it. What's that? The friends you make, they know friends you make like the ones when you're 12 years old. That's it. And it's true, right? It's true. Yeah. And it's very true. That's, that's great. It's very true. Um, I think I might have a book for that. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. That's impressive. A lot of people don't know that. And it's one of my favorite quotes. I love it. I said favorite again. but um, So what, what could these four innocent, naive kids... 12-year-old boys teach us about today's workplace, right? You think four 12-year-old boys in the 1950s, what could they possibly teach us about today's workplace? Quite a bit, actually. And if you look at this question here, and you, you would think this is kind of the definition of a stupid question, right? I mean, of course, of course Goofy is a dog. What else would Goofy be? He's a dog. But when the kids are around a campfire, they're talking, they're, ta they're having conversations about uh, life in general, and they're talking about things 12-year-old kids would talk about, Disney characters and what is Goofy. And so one of them says, of course he's a dog. And another one says, well, wait, he's, he wears a hat and drives a car. And so then the other, another kid says, yeah, what the hell is Goofy? And it starts this conversation about what is Goofy. And what's really cool about that is that something actually magical happened there. Yeah, remember, unless we're like in a room full of Neil deGrasse Tysons, when we ask complex questions in meetings, in conferences, even with customers sometimes we tend to do that. In our little bubble, we use acronyms and things that maybe our customers don't even understand. They often go unanswered, and where people might be able to contribute, they don't because the, the question is so complex, people don't want to feel like they're giving the wrong answer, an answer that's not, uh, maybe sounds as intelligent as they think somebody wants them to have it sound because it's such a complex question. Or worse yet, and I don't know if you guys have this in your company, but I certainly have it in mind. We have Buzzword Bob, and Buzzword Bob is really good at answering complex questions without really saying anything. And so Buzzword Bob will say something like, let's table that while we drill down into these bowling pins and see if we can move the needle with limited bandwidth. But for now, let's take it offline because I need a bio break, so make sure to put in a pin in it and ping me later. I, I think we have about 10 of these in my company. And then they just walk out of the room. And everybody kind of stands here and nods in agreement, and that's it. And you move on to the next question. And you never really had a conversation about what you needed to solve or what the question, the problem, or the challenge was. So what we get out of this is there really are no stupid questions. And I think that sometimes when we ask a question that we think has the most obvious answer, it's actually what drives the best brainstorms because everybody gets involved. When you ask a question like, what is Goofy? Almost everybody is going to say Goofy's a dog. But then if you follow it up with, well, he, drive, he has a hat, wears a car, drives a car, is he really a dog? It sets people back a little bit. Sure, people are going to laugh. I mean, if we use that question as, as the question for this example, but the reality is it starts a conversation and it gets everybody involved. And the best part about it is it eliminates Buzzword Bob because he doesn't know what to do when there's actually a conversation where there needs to be an answer. He just doesn't know what to do. He can't use his buzzwords and if he does, everybody's gonna tell him to be quiet, which is what they need to do. And so this may actually help you uncover the differentiator or the messaging or the position or product that will ultimately lead to the success of your team and your company. So don't be afraid to ask these really simple questions if you want to get the best information, if you want to have the best dialogue, you've got, to, you've got to dial it down to everybody's level, and you might be surprised what they come back with. So, no stupid questions. And the second business lesson that we learned, uh, this was one of my favorite moments in the, in the movie, too. When Vern, Vern who was the, uh, the he played by Sean Astin, he was the heavy set kid, said, do you want to go see a dead body? And it kind of set them on this adventure, right? And they didn't realize what they were getting themselves into. They just were thinking they were gonna go see a dead body, and at 12 years old, it was terrifying and cool. And it was kind of a combination of both. Um, but if you recall, like, when we were kids, a summer day seemed to last a year. Now, a day lasts like four minutes, and we're on to the next day, and then it's a year, and then you're looking at your 30-year high school reunion this weekend like I am. 
and it happened so fast. But back then, you know, your, your, summer, your summer day lasted forever. And so this gave them the opportunity, what they didn't realize, they're gonna have a lot of challenges, and it gave them the opportunity to get to know each other. And that was what was really cool about it. And they had a lot of challenges along the way that they had to overcome. And in order to overcome those challenges, they had to use each other's differences rather than their similarities. And I'll give you an example. I mean, if we, if we talk about the four kids, go back and talk about the four kids. Gordy was kind of smallish and he was bookish and he was a storyteller, he was quiet. Vern was heavy set, nervous and very much a follower. Teddy was, had a quick wit and a quick, quicker tongue, but he was really kind of dark and angry inside. And Chris, played by River Phoenix, was perhaps the most complex. Chris was really smart, uh, but he was also insecure because of the, where he was raised. He was in a, lived in a, in a poor neighborhood with a poor family. He knew that everybody knew that in school. And so he, he felt that insecurity and didn't think he was smart when he actually was probably the smartest of the four. And ultimately, they each found themselves, found themselves in the challenges that they faced. And each of them found something different to help solve one of the challenges. They were getting chased by a train on a railroad track where they had to jump off. They had a gunfire, you know, um, unnecessarily. They had leeches all over their body. Um, they had gang, a gang following them and chasing them that was led by Kiefer Sutherland, if you guys remember him in that movie, very young Kiefer Sutherland. And so they had all these challenges, but along the way, each of them solved, what, each kid solved one of those challenges because of the differences that they had. And that's where our lesson comes in. The goals are achieved by embracing individuality over conformity. So healthy teams and businesses embrace the individual. And I think I talked a little bit about this earlier with the inclusion lesson in the Goonies. When we where employees are allowed, to, or better yet, encouraged to be themselves, that's when really cool things happen. And I think I would suggest you know, maybe the next strategy session you have, the next meeting you have, get everybody to take their corporate mask off and kind of be in their own skin. We, we're all, we all tend to be somebody different at work. And sometimes when we try to be the same, unless we're in the military where there's you know, conformity that's necessary, in a business, we really do want the individuals to contribute from their individuality rather than conformity. And you might be pleasantly surprised by the outcome. And if nothing else, like I said, it's gonna create an atmosphere of acceptance that'll make everybody more comfortable with each other. And it, and it sparks conversations to really get to know each other. And, and that, as Gordy says, as Gordy would say, is grand. So I think really great things happen when we embrace the individuals rather than conformity. Uh, allow people to be themselves. Allow people to answer the questions or come up with solutions based on their life experience, based on their career experience, instead of what we think it should be. And then ultimately, I think um, in the video uh, that we saw at the beginning talking about disruption and differentiators, and that's how you become disruptors. You don't become a disruptor by having everybody conform to the same thing every day. You become disruptors because individuals are allowed to be themselves, and they put out really interesting messages that you may not have thought about. You go home that night as the owner of the business or as the manager, and you think about it, you think, wow, that was really interesting. We would have never thought about that if we had not allowed people just to be themselves and be individuals. Okay, so we are on to mixtape quiz number two. And uh, this movie, I give you a little hint with one of the characters here in the first lesson. So I set unrealistic goals a la rat and you might surprise yourself. I'm waiting for you to, nothing? How about this? Of course, all right, of course make sure to order enough lunch for everyone. Does anyone have that one? No, you get a bad gift. <laughs> uh, okay. How about this clue? The soundtrack included Jackson Brown and the Cars. That's awesome. I didn't think anybody would get that after the first clue. That's great. Yeah, Forrest Whitaker, John Dre Judge Reinhold, Phoebe Cates, Mr. Hands, and Sean Penn as Jess Bacoli. And that's why you order lunch for everyone, because then you don't get anything. So... Okay, who, who said Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Turtles? I wish I had something worse than this, actually, for that one. <laughs> Do what you want with it. Make it a dartboard. Whatever. You were the one? No, no, no. Who was it? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. You can, you know, like I said, make it a dartboard if you like. Yeah. Thanks. That was great. That was awesome. Yeah. It's... <laughs> Ironically enough, I put that on Twitter, and I don't know if you guys saw Revenge of the Nerds, but uh, the guy who played Lamar retweeted it, which I thought was like one of the highlights of my life. Um, and he only has about 200 followers, but still it was cool. 
Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water before we jump into the next, next one. That if you guys don't know, or, I mean, we're, obviously, has anybody not seen ET? Is, I don't have a I don't have a bad enough gift to give you for not seeing ET. Okay, so ET, right? <laughs> Um, again, to make us feel old, June of 1982 is when E.T. came out. Um, hopefully they're never, ever, ever, ever going to redo this movie. Um, although I did just hear they're redoing Weird Science, which is super disturbing. I don't know how they're going to do that. I just think they should re-release these movies instead of redoing them. Um, I was in eighth grade, and um, at that time I was going through clear still faster than the girls in my class were going through non-ozone-friendly hairspray. It was not a good time for me. Um, and it lasted for about a year and a half. I was, I think, all five foot five, 105 pounds, and I was breaking out like a beast. And it was just a terrible year. Um, but ET was, ET helped me get through it. And um, Blade Runner, Rocky Three were also at the box office. Rocky Three, Clubber Lang, one of my favorite villains ever. Mr. T was just amazing in that. No one else could have played that role. Uh, the top 40 music charts as well. Again, super eclectic. You had Soft Cell with Tainted Love, if you guys remember that one, another kind of one-hit wonder which made the 80s awesome. Uh, Willie Nelson happened to be on the top 40 as well. Um, Human League, and then uh, the number one song at the time was with Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. Anybody? Ebony and Ivory. Ebony and Ivory, yeah. Uh, that was the number one song, so pretty. Oh, and Asia. Asia as well was on the, on the top 40. So you, you pretty much had every genre covered for the most part. Um, as I said, hopefully I don't have to tell you the, the plot of E.T., but you know, essentially the, this gentle alien from billions of miles away ends up on our planet and he wants to find his way home. That's basically Jamie. I'm going to send you a digital version of E.T. <laughs> um, okay, so E.T., um, two business lessons that we learned from E.T. Very valuable business lessons for today's workplace. Uh, there was a moment when E.T. said, be good, and it was at the end of the movie, and he was talking to Elliot and Gertie, and Gertie was Elliot's little sister, played by Drew Barrymore. I think she was six or seven at the time, maybe, eight years old at the most. And he was getting ready to head home on his spaceship, and these were the last two words that he said, be good. One of my more favorite subdued scenes in the movie is when he, E.T. is holding a pot of dead flowers, and he points at it, and the flowers bloom, and he says, be good, and Gertie is, you know, really obviously super impressed. Me, me too, because I wish I could do that. It'd be a cool bar trick. Um, but they, they bloom in full. And so uh, E.T. really is about being good, and we can see it. There's not, it's not an accident that his anatomy was built in a way where we could see his heart. And we could see his heart turn red when he did good things. And so um, that was not an accident, from what I read, in, in the way that he, they designed his anatomy. What Be Good taught us really is what's, what's happened over the last, we'll call it 10 to 12 years, I guess, and really accelerated in the last five to seven, is companies with social responsibility. And before, if you were an employee and you wanted to go volunteer somewhere, Habitat for Humanity, whatever, you typically had to take vacation days, personal days to do this. Empl uh, companies in the last decade or so have started to embrace the idea of their employees using time to volunteer, which is really great. So instead of using vacation days to volunteer, you can go on a, on a mission. You can go work for Habitat for Humanity for a couple of days. My company does it and allow you to um, volunteer. And you do that on the company's time. It's good for the company. It's good for the person. It's good for the world. And that's what Be Good taught us, you know, when, when ET said, be good, social responsibility. In fact, so much so that there are companies now out there like Tom's and Warby Parker and UB, if you are familiar with any of these companies, Tom's, for every pair of, pair of shoes somebody buys, they donate a pair of shoes to somebody in an underprivileged area. Uh, UB does it with school supplies, and then uh, Warby Parker does it with eyeglasses. And so they've built their business models around giving back, and in return, they've actually done very, very well as companies. So now companies are actually starting with a business, mo a business model of social responsibility, of social good. And in return, because of that good karma, and because they have good products, of course, um, they're actually getting very good to returns on their revenue. So um, there's a way to do this where you can be socially respons responsible and build an, a great business model and a great company. And if you, have, if you work for a company that hasn't found their kind of footing with, with their be good mantra, be the person to do it. You know, go to, your, go to the boss, go to the owner of the company and say, look, I think we should do something cool. And here's what I would propose we do. And it doesn't have to be something that takes up a lot of time from the company. It could be something that people inside of the company decide if they want to be a part of or contribute to. 
So there's an opportunity for everybody to get involved here and kind of, you know, and be good, as ET said. So find a cause, right? As I mentioned before, I can't point at flowers and make them come alive. I mean, I got, really got crushed in Vegas the last time I went, so I wish if somebody could do that, let me know because I want to take it, take you with me. You can be my rain man uh, because it, was not, it, was, it wasn't good. Um, and so, I, but ultimately, I think we can all have an impact on someone or something to be good. And, and we don't know, we don't necessarily have to know. Um, we, I'm sorry, we don't have to necessarily see like our heart glow. We're not going to see our heart glow, but we all know how it feels to be good and to do good for somebody or something. Something as simple as, you know, buying a cup of coffee for somebody behind you just because. You know, um, you see somebody struggling with a couple of their kids and they're trying to get to their order, you know, help them order something. It's, it's easy things like that. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go for a week to, you know, an under, underprivileged uh, country and, and, and volunteer your time. You can do something simple. The person behind you, pay their toll, 50 cents in the toll, pay their toll. It's little things like that that go a long way. And it's that whole paid forward, which was another pretty cool movie. Um, not the 80s though, uh, but it's a whole paid, paid forward mentality. And I want to digress just a little bit here because I'm not somebody who typically cries at movies, but there are two times that I have, and I always do, no matter what, whether I was 12 or 48 like I am today. When I see E.T. on the riverbank, and he's just pale white, and his heart isn't red anymore, I can't, I don't know why, but it just it makes me tear up, so it's not like a first date movie for me. And, um, and then the second one is when, uh, I don't know if you guys saw Castaway, but when uh, Wilson, the volleyball, is floating away and Tom Hanks is screaming, Wilson, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know why, but the volleyball just <laughs> makes me cry. I don't know. So volleyball and an alien from another planet make me cry. But humans, not so much. I, I don't know. It's weird. So, and maybe only yeller. Uh, one more lesson that E.T. taught us, and this one's very personal to me. Um, you know, this is about having fun with the 80s and stuff, but this is a very personal lesson to me. And when E.T. said these three words, uh, uh, E.T. phone home, it really went, it was like, I'll be back, yo Adrian, go ahead, make my day. All of these, all of these kind of American lexicon uh, uh, quotes that we got from movies. And E.T. phone home went right in there. So he had just one singular mission to go home. He was billions of miles away. He was on a planet that he didn't know. He, there was a language he didn't understand or speak. Everybody was chasing him. And he, had, he didn't know where to put his trust. He had no food, he had no water, he had nothing. But he just wanted to go home. That's all he wanted was to go home. And he found a way. E.T. found a way to go home with all these challenges in front of him. Billions and billions of miles away. No idea where he is. And he found a way to go home. And despite, as easy as it is for us to do it today, a lot of us don't do it enough. So we can, whether if it's transportation, you take an Uber, you, you take a train, you take a plane, you drive yourself, depending on how close somebody is, you walk. If you can't get to the person, if they're international, if you just can't get home, we have Skype, we have FaceTime, we have WhatsApp, we have obviously the phone. We have all of these different ways to communicate with the people that we love and that we care about, and we always find excuses not to do it. And here is little E.T. who had all these things in front of him and he's billions of miles away from home and he finds a way to get home because he wanted to be with his family and his loved one and his friends. And it does teach us a really valuable lesson about finding ways to get home. And I, I say this because, you know, and of course, I'm not, I'm allergic to cats. I don't, not like cats, but I know their family, but it's hard for me to like get used to that. I don't know if I, I've just... I, I, I love dogs, I have rescue dogs, I love dogs, but cats I'm not sure about yet. Um, but I mean, we all have somebody or something waiting for us every evening, you know, even if it's a hamster. And you need to go home and spend time with that, with that person or with your, with your pet, you know, your family member. We always find these last second work things that we have to do, and they're important, believe me, our careers, our companies are very important, but a lot of times it's an excuse. If it's gonna be there tomorrow, unless we're you know, a heart surgeon and somebody's laying on the operating table or we're a homicide detective and we've got, you know, as a TV show says, 48 hours to solve the crime, um, a lot of the times these things can wait and we, we put them in front of everything that we care about outside of our career because we feel like it's more important. And the reason this is important to me, and, and I'm just gonna get serious for a minute here because um, I, you know, all of us grew up with best friends. We talked about Stand By Me. And I had two buddies, Chris and Dexter, who were my best friends growing up. From the time we were five years old, we all met when our helmets were too big in baseball. We, you'd hit the ball and you have to pick up your helmet and run. And um, they both passed away, one at 23 and one at 38. 
and both of them passed away on Friday nights. I got calls on Saturday morning, and I picked up the phone, and I saw their number. And I had talked to them a lot. I mean, not as much as I should have. But uh, uh, not enough that I knew when I got that call at 9 a.m., one of them at 9 a.m., one of them at 8, 13 a.m., that something was wrong. And um, they both passed away, and that was it. I mean, that's it. So my two best friends that I grew up, that I grew up with from five years old through high school, through college, are gone. They're never coming back. And there are so many things that I regret about the time I didn't spend with them. When I moved to Florida away from Maryland, I was you know, far enough away that I had to take a plane home. I should have done it more. I mean, these were the guys that I shared my life experiences with growing up, and I didn't do it. And so when I was going through watching ET again, and I, this ET phone home, it just kind of clicked in for me. And it's why it's really important to me, and, and, and why it should be important to everybody. Even if there's just one person that you care about in the world, make sure you spend time with them. Because it really, it's, it's amazing how fast it happens. And you know, the next day, that's it. So um, you're doing a eulogy at your friend's funeral and you're just kind of sitting there like, what just happened? So um, phone home, <laughs> for sure. And maybe you'll get lucky. I mean, as, I, as my laundry bag here of, goodie bag of goodies says, um, my, maybe dessert will be Reese's Pieces. You'll get lucky and it'll be an awesome dessert. So phone home, please do it. Even if you have to do it at the next break. Okay, <laughs> the last movie that we're going to talk about today, um, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and uh, John Candy, I love that guy, and I miss that guy so much, so many great movies, and he, he this, this movie actually came out in November of 1987, and it was basically the trifecta, it was John Hughes, it was Steve Martin, and it was John Candy, and the three of them, um, actually, November of 1987, and let me just say that I was embracing my final year of high school with um, some things that I would highly recommend. I don't have kids. It's probably a blessing for everyone in this room that I don't. Um, because I was spending the last year of high school um, spending less time in school because I was doing things like wearing a shirt that said, who farted? They suspended me for that. Um, I got back three days later and I had these, I found these at a magic shop, I found these little stink bombs. Um, there were these little glass, and when you stepped on it, the, the glass disappeared. So there's no evidence. I mean, I can get away with this. So I went into the lunchroom and I dropped two of them. And it cleared out 450 kids and teachers from the lunchroom. It was an awful smell, and it was there for a long time. And I wouldn't have gotten caught except for one of my friends told on me because they thought he did it, and he got scared. And so I was in school for a week, I was out of school for a week. In school for a week, I was out of school for a week. And then, you know, basically my parents said, keep this up and you're going to be out of the house. I'm like, okay. So I got straight, you know, so to speak. <laughs> no more stink bombs, no more obscene shirts to school. Um, but, plane trains and automobiles. And the box office at the time was actually full of cult classics and some generational classics as well. Remember, this was November, right? So right around Thanksgiving, actually, I think it was the day after Thanksgiving, actually. And, um, there was a rabbit in a movie that was having a tougher time than his friend the turkey during Thanksgiving. It's a fatal attraction. Uh, was out and that was a horrifying scene, especially for somebody who loves animals. But um, yeah, but the turkey was happy because he was like, you know, I'm not envious of you. And Princess Bride, uh, one of my favorites, came out. Police Academy, which they're remaking. I don't know why, but they're also remaking Roadhouse, which is really upsetting too. Uh, and then Dirty Dancing, which they already made, remade. And Dirty Dancing, I gotta be honest, I never saw it. I love Patrick Swayze, but that song, I Had the Time of My Life, ended up being my prom song. I can't. I mean, I heard it at least 60 times that night, and every time they played it, all the girls cried. And everybody had to go dance. And it was just not, I can't. I just, every time Dirty Dancing comes on, I turn it off, I can't watch it. And I love Patrick Swayze. Uh, the top 40 was super eclectic. So you had Springsteen and Sting, who are going to be in the Hall of Fame if they're not already. They may be already. I'm assuming they are. And then you also had two people who would not be in the Hall of Fame, Debbie Gibson and Tiffany, who were also on the music charts. And uh, we were introduced to Johnny Depp in 21 Jump Street, and we were all going down to Fraggle Rock, which they're actually remaking as well. So Fraggle Rock is coming back. Uh, as I mentioned, this was a trifecta of talent, Steve Martin, John Candy, and John Hughes. So Steve Martin played Neil Page, and Neil Page was this kind of buttoned up square, super uptight, 
advertising executive who ends up with John Candy's character, Del Griffith, who's just fantastic. And Del is this kind of affable, overbearing sales guy, shower curtain ring sales guy. There's the shower curtain rings in the laundry bag, goodie bag. Um, so the two of them end up together because they have delays, diversions, cancellations of all of their transportation, and they end up together on this trip, and they could not be more different. And so along the way, they have a lot of different things that happen to them. But they also taught us two very valuable lessons. So if you remember Dell, uh, when he first meets Neil Page, he introduces himself and then he says he's the shower curtain ring salesman from the American Light and Fixture. And uh, it brings a smile to my face whenever I say Dell Griffith because I just, I, I never met John Candy, but I just feel like that was probably John Candy in real life. I mean, I feel like his personality, that big kind of awesome personality was probably how he was. Um, and he's affable, he's optimistic, he loves his product, and more importantly, as we find out through the movie, he loves his customers. Loves his customers so much, they're willing to pretty much do anything for him. And there's a great scene where he's selling shower curtain rings as earrings in the bus stop to try to raise money for them to get a bus ticket home. And uh, he's, he actually does raise enough money, and he, he's telling women these are the Daryl Strawberry autographed earrings, things like that. And he sells them, and he does a great job with it. But ultimately, it's gonna come down to how well you sell, right? It's going to come down to how well you sell what you do. You can have the best product in the world if nobody knows about it, or if you're just not a cool person to deal with, then you're not going to sell your product and you're not going to sell your service. So Dell teaches us that. He teaches us to be, um, to be affable, to be optimistic, and most importantly, to, be, to, to, to love what you do. And that's what he did. He loved what he did. He loved his customers and he loved his products. And we all have, our companies all have a plenty of Neil Pages, right? So we have the pessimists. We need the optimist. And the last lesson that they taught us was, um, basically throughout the movie, they're kind of find themselves in a multitude of transportation talent challenges that I mentioned before. And Neil gets the worst of it. He's the pessimist. If you know 80s music, uh, bands like the Smiths and Joy Division, which were super, super pessimistic and really, really dark, um, Neil Page made them look like singing birds, like chirping birds in the morning. He was a super, super pessimistic guy. But he also had the toughest time during this challenge that they had. As Neil said, as much trouble as he had on the little journey, he said, I'm sure I'll, 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 one day I'll look back on it and laugh. And I can tell you from my career journey, I've had a lot of delays and diversions and cancellations, but it is a journey and you need to enjoy the ride because all of these things, including seating arrangements, who you sit next to on a plane can make all the difference in the world when you're on a 10 hour flight to Germany like I was two weeks ago and the person sitting next to you is interesting at best. Um, even explosions of fires are all going to be part of your personal, of your professional journey. But they're all going to provide you with opportunities to learn. And more importantly, they're definitely going to give you an opportunity to look back and laugh. And that's really what we all want to do. I mean, the, the career, careers can be awesome. Careers can be difficult at times. But ultimately, we want to look back and laugh at our career journey. And I think if you, look, if you think about your career now, there are probably moments where you look back and you think, man, I was so uptight about that or I was so stressed about that. But in the, re the reality is, it was pretty funny. And now I look back and it's pretty, it, was a pretty fun, it was pretty funny, we laughed, we had a good time. So I think your career will be enjoy, a journey, enjoy the ride. Neil Page, the ultimate pessimist, enjoy the ride with Del Griffith and um, that was not an easy thing to do. I have one more uh, quiz and then I'll wrap up. So, uh, okay, the first lesson from this movie, this one's gonna be a little more challenging. I think you really gotta be an 80s person to know this movie, so I'm challenging you guys a little bit on this one. Don't fake it to make it. The fall can be fast and unforgiving. Be true to yourself and it will come. And the second one is someday you two could go from mowing lawns to Dr. McDreamy. Sorry, I like the 80s too. Um, can't buy love. That's, so you get two books. I don't know, if you have like a friend. <laughs> yeah, that's actually it. I didn't think somebody would get it right away, but uh, yeah. So, can't buy me love. And here's the really funny thing about this. You want to talk about an evolution or a transformation? That's Patrick Dempsey, and that's Patrick Dempsey. <laughs> so I don't know if he's a vampire, but certainly um, has, has aged well. This is my favorite quote from the 80s, and it's the way I try to live my life. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you can miss it. It's a modern version of stop and smell the roses, right? And I think this is the best way to live. Uh, I love this quote. I have it in my house. When people walk in, it's on my wall. Um, and I went to a restaurant one night, and they had it above the kitchen, and I thought, this is the greatest restaurant ever, and I'll always come back. And so I do think it does move very, very fast. And the Poet Laureate 
Ferris Bueller from the 80s said it perfectly. So take, take some time, you know, like I said, phone home if you get a chance today. And don't forget to slow down and look around once in a while. So thanks, uh, North Carolina Outdoor Advertising Association, or I should say North Carolina and South Carolina Outdoor Advertising Association for the time. I really appreciate you guys inviting me here. Thanks so much.